Welcome everyone to the DMA webinar series today in partnership with Thomson Reuters. My name is Angela Strock. I'm a senior director uh, with the DMA's West Coast Practice Development. We certainly appreciate you spending some time with us today. And uh, many of you over the years have welcomed me into your office and I welcome you now into my home, the Harvest Edition. Now let's do a quick overview of DMA. So we are state and local tax advisors and we've been in the business for nearly 50 years. Uh, traditionally, we've been only state and local, but we've now expanded into international market with the opening of our German office in 2021. We are proudly an employee-owned company, and we strive to serve as an extension of the, uh, the tax department. And when I say that, we really focus on client partnering, so that's tax minimization, enhancing your cash flow, compliance through returns, and process improvement. This is really where we spend a lot of time, and, and today's uh, webinar will focus very much on best practices, leverage technology, um, and overall process improvement. And of course, knowledge transfer, as we're here to do today. Um, we'll focus on all of our focus areas here are listed, um, so I won't go through them all, but do note that, uh, again, I mentioned the international tax, as well as customs and duties has been added to our uh, list of service offerings. So with that, I will turn it over to my partner in crime, Stephen from Thomson Reuters. <laughs> Thank you, Angela. Uh, Steven Salata, Enterprise Sales Executive for uh, One Source Indirect Tax on the Thomson Reuters side. I know we have many, many customers on the call today, uh, whether you currently use our indirect tax product or other various products that the Thomson Reuters family offers. Uh, just some quick facts, Thomson Reuters uh, is the uh, global leader and the most trusted source of, of information. We categorize that into three main divisions of, uh, of the Thomson Reuters brand. We have the, uh, the, the tax and accounting division, which we're here representing today. We also have a legal division as long as Reuters News, which I'm, I'm sure you're all familiar with. Our customers rely on us globally with this information, intelligence, and technology to make uh, very important and, and trusted business decisions. So uh, just wanted to touch on this quickly as well. I know the main focus of today's call is, is kind of indirect tax, uh, indirect tax technology, and how to streamline things on, on both the purchasing side and use tools like Alteryx to make all of your jobs easier. Also wanted to just bring up this slide briefly to touch on some of the other areas that we, we offer solutions for. So uh, you know, we have direct tax solutions, transfer pricing, global trade, uh, different supply chain solutions amongst many others. So just wanted to, to throw that out there. I know, I know like I said, we have uh, some existing customers on that use uh, one or more of these solutions and we appreciate you all joining us today and, and hopefully you get some useful information out of the presentation. So um, I'm Joni Johnson Powell. We'll start presenting, um, give a little background about our presenters, but I'm Joni Johnson Powell. I am the Vice President of Tax Technology Consulting at DMA. I also focus um, my time on the tax process optimization side and I could basically lead a team of both functional and technical resources that we really focused on providing solutions for our clients. Hi everybody, Tom Farmer with Thomson Reuters. I'm a senior solution consultant, been with the company since 2011, but have been in various roles in various tax organizations for well over 20. So my background is uh, sales tax, uh, ERP solutions, things like that, and uh, previously was a sales news tax manager. Thank you. Kelly? Great. Uh, my name is Kelly Lear. I'm a director on the Partnerships and Alliances team at Thomson Reuters um, and brought the Alteryx partnership uh, together last year. So excited to talk to you guys a little bit about that today. Um, my background is I have over 20 years experience in tax technology transformation projects, systems implement implementations and integrations. So kind of dealt with customers like yourselves in trying to help you with all your data management and uh, tax technology automation projects uh, over the years. So thank you. Uh, Bradley? 
Hi everyone, I'm Bradley Priestmeyer. I am the uh, senior solutions engineer. So I deal a lot with um, how, the, how the tax system integrates with other options and how it can communicate with them. Um, I'm out of the Houston, Texas area. And prior to that, as part of my background, I was with the big four accounting firms doing implementations for clients based on what they need. So we'll get started with our agenda today. Uh, we're gonna start off with kind of talking about the evolution of tax technology, where we find ourselves today. Then we'll, we'll uh, lead into a discussion around funding your technology deployment. You know, in, in, an, in a time of like, like COVID, we're seeing a lot of tax departments, you know, struggle with, with how do I deploy and, and implement new, new solutions um, when we've got a lot of tight budgets and a lot of change in our financial uh, arena. So we'll talk a little bit about that, and then I'm going to pass it over to our OneSource team, and Tom's going to talk about uh, OneSource and the use tax function within the application, and then we'll have Bradley and Kelly talk about how uh, you can use OneSource with Alteryx. Okay, so let's get started and talk a little bit about where we are today and the impacts of the, an, an ever-changing environment we find ourselves. But before we get started, let's start with our polling question. So our first polling question is, who are the indirect tax technology stakeholders in your organization? And so we have listed here, is that your IT department? Uh, is it tax, procurement, accounting, business services, C-suite, or other? Um, and, you know, in this day and age of, of technology, we're, we're finding that at one point, you know, a lot of times it was IT and tax that were impo involved in those decisions. But now we're seeing that, you know, in, in terms of stakeholders from a tax technology perspective, there are a lot of other groups that are involved and have an interest in automation or gaining efficiencies uh, in the tax compliance function. So, you know, we'd really be interested to kind of see where each of you uh, today find yourselves in your particular organization. So here, in terms of the results, we're seeing the majority of you, um, you know, tax department and IT, but we're also seeing, you know, procurement and accounting finance, uh, business services, which is a lot of, um, is right in line with what we see a lot of times with our clients, that there are a lot of other departments that are involved in um, tax technology and its deployment uh, in an organization. So let's talk a little bit about where we find ourselves today. I mean, it's really a rapidly changing environment for all of us, uh, and a lot of it has to do with external factors. Um, you know, we're seeing a lot of change around the global rollout of uh, new tax laws. Uh, a good example of that is kind of the EU 2021 changes around digital services. Uh, we're also seeing just the overall um, balance of, of what our economy looks like. We're moving from a manufacturing and tangible for personal goods um, environment to more of a gig and digital economy. We're also seeing that there's a lot of data that's moving um, around organizations. There's a lot of exchange of taxpayer data um, with author tax authorities um, and reporting information that is real and on time. And, and so we're seeing that tax the tax function is really uh, becoming a focus um, from a tax authority perspective and having real-time um, access to your data. We're also seeing that the responsibilities for the tax department are, are increasing. Um, a good example of that are a lot of the marketplace legislation that we've seen amongst the states where you as the marketplace facilitator have a responsibility for collecting and reporting your customer's tax information, not alone your own tax information. We're also seeing the exponential growth of big data. Uh, we're seeing a lot of interest and expansion and advanced analytics and really being able to dig into that data because we're all culminating data from a number of different uh, locations and uh, platforms. And then, you know, we find ourselves in COVID-19 today. Uh, you know, we saw in the last couple of years, you know, trade wars with China and a lot of acquisitions and, and divestitures. And all of these have a big impact on, you know, the responsibilities and the expectations of the tax, the tax function. And so in this slide, we really wanted to depict kind of this evolution that we're seeing overall. Uh, in the indirect tax function. You know, at one time, the focus was on a centralized tax department 
where you had a lot of manual processes. So you're, you're pulling data. We even had PDF reports at that time. Um, and, go, and what we've seen is, is a move from that centralized tax department to even you know, the next phase of, of tax technology that we saw were automating the calculations of uh, customer data and internal data. And so we moved from you know, manual processes to automating the calculation, but that was really an on-premise calculation where that server and, and the software was loaded uh, locally within your company. Then we see ourselves move into a de decentralized um, environment where the tax function may be in multiple locations um, outside the U.S. and within the U.S. And a lot of companies deploying um, both services and uh, their people uh, globally. Then we also have seen enhanced reporting. So we're moving away from PDF reports, but really having the ability to, to dig into detailed data. And that's kind of where this, this concept of in, uh, big data comes from, that we're, we're gathering data from multiple locations and really have the need to have more than a, a PDF report to review that data. And then the other area that we're seeing a lot of growth in um, as we evolve is the use of bots um, and cloud-based solutions. So we're no longer seeing that we're deploying automated tax calculations on a server within your company, but now our IT departments are feeling more comfortable with a cloud-based solution. And we're utilizing um, different technologies like RPA to automate repetitive um, tasks that you know, we engage in on a monthly basis. And then the last part of the evolution I think that we're also seeing is this artificial intelligence. So utilizing um, smart technologies to help us identify anomalies, um, help us to make good business decisions, and help us to, to um, advise and guide our company into areas that we need to focus on um, to mitigate risk and improve efficiencies. So let's jump into another poll question before we move on. If you had additional budget in 2021, would you invest in new technology? Uh, first uh, response is yes, I would enhance uh, our current tax engine. Uh, number two, yes, change my tax vendor, vendor. Number three, yes, I would invest in an analytic software. Or no, my system is perfect. I like that last one. I'd like to see who's got that because a lot of our clients, um, one of the things we do find a lot is even though a lot of companies these days have a software solution deployed, there's still plenty of gaps and plenty of areas that they're looking to improve and always kind of looking to improve the efficiency and the accuracy of that calculation. So it looks like the majority, 41%, would enhance their current tax engine which is not surprising. Um, but coming in in a close second, oh, it looks like a tie, that I would invest in analytic software. So that's, you know, that's a great segue into what we're talking about today. So I appreciate everybody contributing to uh, that, that uh, poll. So continuing on, um, what are we seeing in terms of tax department trends? Well, you know, now we see the tax engine as a tool, um, not just the sole solution, right? So in addition to you know, having a deploy tax engine calculation, uh, there's a lot of other tools that we're using in our day-to-day -day maintenance um, from an indirect tax perspective. Uh, we are seeing a lot of interest, and we'll talk more about this today, in automating the use tax function. Uh, you know, two, three, four years ago, you know, even my team, a lot of our focus was on the sales side of things. But now we're seeing a lot of interest on the purchase side of things and really automating and improving that supply chain management process. Uh, we're seeing a lot of process reviews within audit and compliance. You know, how can we more efficiently and more accurately, you know, engage in our month-to-month -month and month-end process? Increasing certificate management. Uh, we're seeing a lot of interest in this. Uh, we're seeing a lot of interest in uh, certificate refresh. Um, also, you know, finding better workflows from a certificate management perspective. Data analytics is also an important area for month in review, uh, giving visibility into the data and uh, the trends that you're seeing um, from a product and a service perspective within your organization. And then enhancements after audit and over, overpayment review. 
you know, it used to be at one time um, with overpayment reviews or refund um, projects, you, you, it would be great for the tax department to go out and, and get these refunds, but we never kind of fixed why the cause of those refunds. And we're seeing a lot more interest now, especially in our TPO practice, uh, an effort to identify those areas for overpayment or audit risk, but also um, improving and filling those gaps. So why is it important to have a tax technology strategy? Um, you know, it's, we find ourselves in a unique position um, and, and moving ourselves from, a lot of times we talk about a tax being a cost center, but as we, you know, evolve and, and, and our role becomes different within the organization, we're seeing that a lot of tax departments are having a lot of other pressures that become part of their day-to-day -day process. And that includes, you know, deploying tax saving strategies. Uh, you know, generating, being a revenue generating um, operating unit rather than a cost uh, center. And so, you know, being able to recover that, recover sales and use tax overpayments. Uh, I think there's also an expectation that there's a better management of their current, you know, our current processes and looking for continual improvement and efficiencies in those processes because a lot of tax departments have to do a, a lot more um, with less resources and, and smaller budgets. Um, and also the, to expedite the responses in changing environments uh, in, for marketplace uh, providers. You know, we're finding a lot of our clients that are marketplace providers having some responsibilities to, you know, respond to their um, platform sellers, for instance, their questions about tax and how we how those taxes were calculated. And so we're really looking um, and seeing that the tax department has some responsibilities to you know, respond to those inquiries and be very proactive in a lot of these organizations. And you know, an, an important part of uh, the strategy is from a tax technology perspective is really to support corporate initiatives. We're seeing that you know, companies are looking to reduce the risk, uh, better allocate costs, and also transform day-to-day -day processes um, to gain a lot of efficiencies. And then, you know, we're always in this ever-changing environment uh, from a business perspective, and we're all expected to um, accommodate that environment. So next, we're gonna talk a little bit about, you know, funding your tax technology deployment. Um, you know, where we find ourselves today is in, in, an, in a time of, of uncertainty. And so uh, we think that this discussion around funding and how you can look at building that business case is important. So with the first poll question, the question is, are you performing any cost recovery tax reviews currently in your company? And, you know, in this time of COVID, uh, we are finding a lot of clients having interest in you know, finding opportunities to, um, you know, bring in more money to the company, uh, you know, really becoming a, a profit uh, focused uh, department as opposed to a cost, cost center, as we mentioned before. So, yes, so we've got 50% are actually performing cost recovery reviews, which is great. Um, we've got about 7% that are using it to fund technology. And then about 21% um, to offset audit liability. And then the remaining 43% are not. So let's talk about uh, funding your tax technology deployment. You know, when you're looking to, um, you know, get buy-in from your company uh, on a new technology uh, project, it's really important to know who your stakeholders are. Uh, as we talked a little bit, about in that first poll question, a lot of times what we saw, you know, probably four or five years ago, it was really a tax department focused effort. Um, and IT would get involved because of course they had to have the resources to help deploy them. But what we're seeing now is that it really takes a concerted effort to get the buy-in to support a tax technology pro uh, project. And, and part of that is because they're complex, um, it also, I think, as we're talking about the evolution of, of who those stakeholders are, I think it, it touches a lot of other uh, departments. Um, I think a good example of that is your, your operations. Um, if there is an audit assessment, uh, a lot of my clients I've seen have to push down that cost of that audit uh, down to uh, the cost centers where uh, that incurred. 
so your operations folks, your procurement folks have a have a vested interest in in automating and making sure the accuracy um, is there from a tax uh, uh, calculation perspective. And so that also includes accounting. And a lot of times that's going to include, you know, knowing your audience in terms of your CFO, you know, what's his focus? What's his five-year plan? What is his, um, you know, his vision for the company? And really getting the buy-in of, you know, that upper level management from the CF level, C CFO level, or even the CEO level. Um, and another important um, department I think that sometimes we fear get, forget about is HR. Uh, when we think about human capital, well, we mentioned that down below, but when we think about your people um, and really uh, providing a, a good experience for job and, and making sure they're satisfied with their job, but if your folks are spending a lot of time pulling data and playing in spreadsheets and, you know, the majority of their time is in compliance, you know, three or four weeks out of the month, um, you know, is their job satisfaction going to be where they feel like they're in a career that they see some opportunity to grow? So really understanding your audience is a, a very important part of an evaluation as you look to deploy and request um, a new tech technology pro uh, project. Another important um, aspect is really understanding where is your company sit from a digital strategy perspective. Uh, we find that um, from a tax um, interest perspective, as, as the department is looking to deploy new um, tax technology solutions, you know, really knowing what's going on in the company. Uh, the best time to deploy a tax technology solution or tax software solution is when you're already going to upgrade your ERP or if you're deploying a new um, purchasing software, uh, like an Ariba, for instance. Um, or if your company is going to start to use Concur, a lot of times it's really great to fall in the, the, the coattails of an existing project. Um, if understanding like where your company is going from an e-com perspective, I think, you know, the pandemic has really seen a lot more interest in companies um, providing, you know, services and selling products via an e-com platform. I think it's become even more important since we're not meeting with folks face to face. Um, and then really even, you know, is your company going to deploy a CRM solution? Again, a great opportunity to, um, you know, follow within this digital strategy and raise your hand from a tax perspective and say, hey, you know, we want to be part of this. We, we have some improvements that we'd like to be able to deploy that provide some value to the company. And then as your companies are looking at emerging technologies, uh, I've got clients who uh, the tax department has been able to deploy uh, solutions like Alteric because accounting has a license to it. Uh, and, and accounting is looking to use data analytics to help them manage their day-to-day -day process and Im improve workflows. Uh, there are companies uh, that have a focus on machine learning. Uh, one of uh, a client that that we've worked with in the past um, has a whole team that's dedicated to deploying machine learning within the organization. And so, you know, making sure that you're aware of how you can become part of those initiatives is important. Um, and even blockchain, you know, we, there's a lot of buzz around about this for a couple years ago, but there are companies that are looking to understand how they can deploy blockchain in their day-to-day -day, um, accounting and corporate functions. And so finally, understanding what's your ROI, right? Um, how do you quantify the efficiency gains that you're going to um, be able to recognize from a new software solution uh, from a tax perspective? And what, what about that risk mitigation and uh, the overpayments that you currently have and how you could reduce those overpayments or even identify those overpayments to use as part of that deployment? And then the human capital gains that we mentioned earlier, you know, retaining employ your important employees and job satisfaction. It costs a lot more to keep someone than to hire someone and train. So really, you know, thinking about and being able to communicate to your leadership what's your return on investment. So one of the important things as part of defining a deployment is understanding what that roadmap looks like. And in this particular slide, you know, what we're really just trying to highlight is that there are both short-term enhancements 
as well as long-term enhancements. And any time that you're looking at improving that process, it's important to know, you know, what are those quick hits and quick fixes that we can implement, as well as what is our long-term strategy and plan for um, improving that indirect tax function. So a couple of examples of, you know, ideas that you'd, you'd like to be able to communicate um, as you talk about a new project deployment are, you know, identifying those quick fixes like, you know, fixing your ERP. We, we see that a lot of you are interested in and have the, the, the desire to enhance your tax engine and make improvements around content and, and custom rules. Uh, and so that's also a, a really important area to focus focus on and communicate with your leadership on some of the, the areas that you guys can make improvements. Uh, you know, creating tax matrices or updating tax matrices is important. Um, you know, being able to review CapEx and then documenting and updating workflows. Uh, a lot of times we'll find that there's there's turnover, there's, there's employees, new employees that come into place, and it's really important to have some documentation on the existing workflows within the, within the, tax, um, the tax group. Long-term enhancements, of course, you know, that we're seeing a lot and important in your roadmap is you know, enhancing configurations, implementing a new engine, um, whether it's the, for the first time or maybe looking at other opportunities to look at other vendors. Uh, we're seeing a lot of that, uh, how to create custom uh, utilities. You know, a lot of these long-term enhancements take a good plan and roadmap as well as, you know, a design um, for what that future state will look like. So in this slide, um, just kind of overviewing, you know, where those opportunities to fund um, your tax de technology deployment. And a lot of those can be identified through tax savings. Um, if you're manufacturing, you know, identifying, you know, where you can find uh, opportunities to uh, make claims with states for in the manufacturing area. We see a lot of that in R&D. Uh, data centers are, are a good opportunity because some of the exemptions that states uh, provide for data centers. Government contracting, you know, uh, a lot of times uh, in the, the, the use tax and purchase side of things, are we making sure that we're not um, overpaying or, or charging tax on certain purchases that we make. Um, interstate commerce, as well as, you know, the service arena, professional non-taxable um, services. So really identifying those, those, those tax saving areas, um, there's quite a few areas that you can focus on when you're looking at funding your, your deployment. Um, you know, it's really important, as we've talked about, is just really de defining what that roadmap for process for process improvement, um, because when you're looking at creating the strategy, you can already create that roadmap as part of as part of this review. Um, also, looking at putting together you know this business case for uh, tax technology deployment is what you walk away from is an inherently built business case in why and how you can deploy a um, a tax technology um, strategy for your company. And then also being able to utilize from these tax saving areas identify a tax recovery that funds these process and system changes. So it really is a end to end process when you strategize and take the time to develop a plan around deploying a new technolo uh, tax technology solution. So now I'm gonna pass it on to Tom, who's gonna talk a little bit about one source and the use tax function. Thank you. First off, let's go ahead and start with another poll question. So with this one, what tax solution does your organization currently use for indirect tax? So when you're looking at these, it could be things that have been purchased, uh, an off-the-shelf solution, or what I've found over the years is that many companies are managing this using Excel spreadsheets, uh, rules sheets that they've developed over the years just you know, by way of, of audit results and, and their own research and things like that. Um, so it's like uh, the top three would be the one source engine, Avalara and Excel um, with some other varieties there as well. So that's, that's nice to hear uh, that, you know, we've got people on that are familiar with the one source engine, which actually leads us into the uh, next slide. 
So the way the one source tax decision works, um, it's actually ERP agnostic. And so it can connect to many different ERPs. So I've got SAP and Oracle listed here, but it can just as easily connect to things like PeopleSoft, Microsoft Dynamics, NetSuite, et cetera, et cetera. Additionally, it can connect to purchasing software that you may have, such as SAP's Ariba, Coupa, even a homegrown system. We, what we run into many times is that a company has developed their own in-house system over the years, and they still use it for things like billing or purchasing or things like that. Well, the tax engine is able to connect to that. So what would happen, whether it's a purchase situation or a sales situation, the calling system would reach out to the tax engine for information. So for example, if it's a purchase, that information would be things such as what was the item or service purchased, where was it put into place, who is the vendor, things like that. And based on that information, on the purchasing side, the tax engine can look at the vendor charge tax and evaluate whether it was correct or not. So if it turns out that it was correct, hey, everything's great, move on to the next item. But if there was an issue, maybe the vendor charged you too much or maybe not enough or none at all. And so it's gonna be necessary to do some kind of an accrual. So this way you're able to accrue either the missing piece, maybe they didn't charge you city tax or something like that, you're able to go ahead and make an accrual for that piece of it. And that information goes back and forth within milliseconds. So it's nothing that's going to delay a process significantly. Now, that information is then written to the audit database, and that information is then available to you for reporting. So that could be reporting for internal use, maybe for audit responses, things like that. But also you can use it for compliance products as well, or compliance information. And we also have the information available for certificates. So if you're managing certificates on the sales side, you're able to run reports that will list out who you have certificates from, what the expiration dates are, how often they've been used, things like that that can be very important for audit defense and audit backup. So we talk about coverage. One of the things that's unique about uh, the OneSource engine is that it's globally available. And what I mean by that is from a tax content perspective, we have content for over 200 countries worldwide. So what the screen represents is kind of a jurisdictional breakout. And what we mean by, mean by that is if you do business in the US, you're familiar with the fact that you may have to respond to state, city, county, other local jurisdictions when it comes to not only charging the right rate, but also audits and things like that. But when you look at it worldwide, there are several countries that they just have a single jurisdiction. Like if you look at the UK, there's just a single jurisdiction and Australia is the same way. But if you look at a country like say Brazil, which is one of the most complicated and complex tax regimes that are out there, they have over 5,000 jurisdictions to have to wrestle with. Additionally, if you look at some place like India, they have 37 jurisdictions they have to worry about. So that complexity is not just in the US, but can be worldwide, depending upon where you do business. The nice thing about it is we have coverage for over 200 countries throughout the world. So if you do an expansion, say you begin having sales in Latin America or parts of the EU, we can easily cover you and, and deal with the, uh, the issues that you may have to wrestle with. Related to that, we also have the ability to assist with the compliance aspects. So this would be filling out or enabling, <coughs> excuse me, enabling you to fill out the returns in North America, so Canada, US, but also in Latin America, EMEA, which covers not only the EU, but uh, countries that are outside of the EU, um, like you know, Turkey, Hungary, uh, Switzerland, things like that, and also the Asia Pacific region. And this would also include things that you're having to come to odds with, such as making tax digital in the UK, but also the safety requirements that are in parts of Europe. So we're able to help you deal with those compliance issues as well. So when you think about it, it's really an end-to-end -end solution where it's covering not only calculating the tax or making accruals if you need to, but also being able to put that data onto returns for you to make it easy for you to solve that, that issue as well and save time. 
So what we've got on screen right now is a screenshot of the tax content. So we have our own team that's deployed uh, worldwide to gather content, not only in the US, but also worldwide. So we keep up with legislation that may result in a tax rate change or the taxability change. Maybe something's gonna flip from being exempt to being taxable or vice versa. So our team is keeping on top of that for you and releasing updates as warranted. So when we look at this list here, on the left side of the screen, you'll notice we've got a lot of categories. So we've got various software categories. And as you're aware, software is pretty complex because there's differences in the taxability of whether it's something that is downloaded software versus delivered on a CD or even SaaS software, things like that. There's all kinds of a variety in how that's taxed by the jurisdictions. So when you look at the center area, it says commodity code. What that represents is a UN SPSC code. It's United Nations standardized code that's used to index all of these different types of categories of goods and services. Now, the benefit of this is if you at some point decide that you want to deploy, say, um, a REBA or a Coupa purchasing software, these commodity codes are already built into the system. So the value of that is after you've already mapped these within the tax engine, the data is already there. So it's going to save you a lot of time in that in the further mapping within Coupa or REBA. So it's able to save you time, keep it consistent, so that way you're getting the results that you're, that you're anticipating. And on the right side of the screen is where you have the different states and whether or not the particular product or service is considered taxable or not. Now, those definitions go to the local level, which is important in states like Colorado, Louisiana, and Alabama, who are home rule states, and frequently have an issue where the taxability of the product or service at the state level can be very different than what it is at the local level. So this way, when you're making an accruals, you're accruing what you need to accrual, and you're not over accruing and having to go in through the process of trying to get a refund back from the jurisdiction. And lastly, this is a screenshot of the release notes that you receive whenever there's a content update. So what we're seeing in the US is around two to three updates on average, and that can come all at the beginning of the month or come mid month, it really depends upon the legislation. But the nice thing about it is the information that you receive from us is going to be similar to this PDF document that outlines what is new in that particular content release. So what's changed, um, are there rates, jurisdictional changes, taxing uh, of a particular product or service has changed. So this way your team is able to stay up to date with what's going on with tax. Because as we know, it's changing all the time and it can be really difficult to keep up with all that on your own. So we try to, to do what we can to make that process easier for you and the team to stay abreast of new changes or any of that kind of stuff. So let's go ahead and get into the tax engine to give you an idea of what, uh, how it works and, and how things go with that. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen here. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and log into the tax engine. And the engine can use whatever web browser that you're familiar with or you, you have at a, say, a company level. So it can be using Chrome, Firefox, whatever variety that you wanna use. So I'm gonna go ahead and get into the engine here. And first off, it's gonna take you to this My Applications page. And what that does is, that is going to give you the opportunity to flip back and forth among the different products that you may subscribe to. So for example, for this user ID, they are able to get into Checkpoint, which is our tax research tool, or get into the tax engine, compliance, or the university training area without having to do another set of logins. So it makes it easier for you to go back and forth. So next, what we're gonna show here is what we refer to as the dashboard. And what this shows you is the particular entity that we're looking at in this case. And if I drop down here, choose a specific entity, mm. excuse me. What it's gonna show at a glance is what my nexus is. So for this particular entity here, Tom's Specialty Manufacturing Company, it has nexus in Australia, the US and Canada. And if I click on the US, it shows that I have nexus throughout the country. 
Additionally, over here in this lower right corner, we've got the certificate status. And what this does is this looks at the certificates that you manage from your customers, and it will alert you as to the number of certificates that are expiring soon. So we've got 60 days, 30 days this week, as well as one here that says the number of certificates that have been added. So when you think about it, you've got a workflow that's built into the system as soon as you log in that gives you information around those certificates to make it easier for you. So also some areas I wanna point out to you, um, we have this company area over here, and this is where you would set up the company structure. So your parent entity, your child entities that are beneath it that can share the same tax policy or it can have a distinctly different tax policy. It's really up to you. And we enable you to uh, take advantage of that flexibility because if you're, say, a company that, that uh, expands by acquisition, if you have an acquired company, you're not necessarily going to bring them on immediately into your ERP, at your, your corp-wide uh, ERP, but also you may not have the same tax policy. So for the first year or so, it may have a completely different tax policy. And we completely allow you to do that. It's really up to you as to how you want to utilize that. Some other areas that you'll configure would be things such as your tax jurisdiction. That's your nexus. So that's where you set up where you have reporting and collection responsibilities. And when you're looking at places like a home rule state, Alabama, Louisiana, Colorado, you can go in and you can configure your nexus at a local level as well. So this way, when you're making it accrual, the accruals will be correct and they're gonna have the correct local taxes on it. Also, if you're making a sale to those particular areas, the correct local tax is gonna be calculated as part of that as well. Another area that you'll utilize is what we refer to as mapping. And this is the mapping of the products and services that you buy or sell with our monitored content. So that way, if it turns out that a particular product is taxable and you make a sale or you buy a certain product, it's going to come up as being taxable. But if it, it changes, maybe it flips from being exempt to being taxable or something like that, your team doesn't have to do anything to make sure that it's registering it correctly. Because what happens is the system sees the transaction, it looks at the product ID, and it goes into the system to say, okay, is this item taxable or exempt based on factors like where is it being sold to or where is it being shipped to? What is the date of the transaction? Things like that, that will tell the system if it needs to be taxed or not. So this way it's hands off your team. You're not having to go in and do a lot of that work to make it, uh, to get the outcome that you're looking for. We also have a sandbox environment that's built into the system. And the neat thing about this, this allows you to create model scenarios, what if scenarios to test your settings, but also let's say that you're gonna be changing um, your tax footprint. You're gonna start doing more sales in a particular area or something like that. You can go in and you can test things ahead of time. Now, one, one scenario that I wanna show you has to do with SaaS software. So, one of the issues with SaaS software is not only the fact that some states tax it, some states don't, but also one of the issues is that in some states like Texas, it's considered a data processing service. It's not really considered a software. So with Texas, it has a reduced taxable basis to it. And you have to understand that. And with a tax engine, you don't have to worry about that because that information is already baked into the tax content that I showed you earlier. So when you're looking at a transaction, what I show is SaaS software being sold to a whole bunch of different locations here. So we have New York City, we have Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, we have Houston, Texas, Massachusetts, Minnesota, Rhode Island, California, Connecticut, New Hampshire, South Carolina, Indiana, Iowa, Virginia, Missouri, Kentucky, Louisiana, Arkansas, Missouri, and Michigan. And the reasons that we've chosen this is because over time, some of these jurisdictions have flipped from being either exempt to being taxable or from taxable to, to uh, being exempt or even changing the tax rate that applies to it. So it's one of these situations where over the last three years, there's been a lot of changes to this particular category of product. And 
it's one of those things that causes a lot of tax personnel a lot of grief because it's something that's really painful for them to deal with. So when I look at the results here, the total amount, which is going to be product plus tax, we also have the gross amount. So this is the amount of the product itself, the effective tax rate. We have the exempt amount over here. And when I look at these different results, you can see in many jurisdictions this is taxable, but some of these jurisdictions is exempt. So if I click on one of the exempt ones here, this is in Minnesota, it breaks down the tax rate by jurisdiction. So you get that granular view that you really want. But also in Minnesota, they consider this an exempt product. And the engine tells you as such. It lists it as being exempt and it lists the tax rate as part of it as well. Now, when you're looking at this from a tax standpoint, you really want to be able to see all the jurisdictions that are part of this because that's what the auditor wants to see. So you're going to want to make sure that when you have a transaction that it's hitting all of those jurisdictions. And that's what we provide with this is not only the tax rates that go to this, but also what's part of that. So in this case here, this is going to New York City. So we've got the commuter transportation district. We have the city level tax. We have the state level tax here for that particular product. And when we're looking at it from, say, um, some of these states here, like look at line three, that's Texas. And again, this is going to Houston, so you're going to see the state level, the Houston city piece, and also the transit district, but it's partially exempt here. And the reason why is because in Texas, it falls under data processing, which has an 80% taxable basis. So that calculation is handled automatically within the system. And the neat thing about this is, if you're looking at using something like this on the purchasing side, you may want to allocate this charge among your different locations that use it. So with that, you can have some of these locations that are actually taxable and some of these locations that are exempt. And you don't really want to make an, a, an accrual in an exempt location because it's, it's going to cost you so much time to get that money back. So by using the tax engine, it goes ahead and uses that logic and utilizes it on an accrual basis to make sure that you're occurring what you need to, and you're not over occurring. My final example is one that um, I used to have to deal with frequently um, in tax departments, and I'm sure many of you have to as well. And this would be a situation where I'm allocating laptops. Okay, so I've got a situation where I've got a laptop order, we're sending new laptops to um, five of our offices in this example here. And I want to make sure that I'm accruing the correct amount for each one of those locations. But what I can do is I can set up what we call an allocation within the system. And I can use criteria to fire that, that allocation, such as a product ID, a laptop, maybe a vendor ID, also maybe a purchase order that could be associated with it. Things like that, tests, so to speak, in order to tell me where these are going to be going and what the criteria is to make it work correctly. So when I look at my document line here, I've got simply laptops and I've got um, the uh, results here. So what it's done is it's looked at my allocation and it's done my calculation. So here's my total dollar amount here. And so I have $40,000 worth of laptops and I've got $43,202 total which means I've got $3,202 of tax that's been calculated. My effective rate for the entire transaction is just a little over 8%. And if I click on my results here, here's, here's how it all makes sense. So of that laptop order, I have 20% of it going to Miami. So here's my Florida related lines here. I have 20% of it going to Atlanta, Georgia. So there's the lines of the transaction that apply to that, such as the city, Atlanta, city sales and use tax, the Fulton County level, but also transportation districts, educational, all of those pieces to it. When we look at New York City at 20%, here's the breakout there. And we also have Pittsburgh, so I've got the breakout. and Lastly, Houston, Texas. And again, I see that jurisdictional breakout. So 
allocations is something that a lot of our customers have really gotten a lot of value out of because it, it removes that manual process of having to break all that information out on their own, which I know is very time consuming and really a headache. The last thing I want to touch upon are the reports. So earlier I talked about how in the background, whenever there's a purchase or a sales transaction, that information is written to the audit database. And that is what we're using as our reporting base. So if I was to look at something like the US document drill down report, what that is gonna do is it's gonna give me the opportunity to look at a bunch of transactions and I can scrutinize specific ones that I wanna see. So first off, I choose the company names that I wanna be part of this, so my entities. I also choose the start and end date. I can then choose specific taxable states that I want as part of this, or I can leave this blank and it'll pull in everybody. The same with tax types and authority types. So after I've made my decision, I'm gonna go in here and I'm gonna run this report. So it's beginning to pull all that information together based on the information that I've requested. Now, I've chosen to show this or to look at this in what's referred to as a browser view. So that allows me to look at the report and then later choose how I want to, to generate that report. So if I want to generate it as a PDF document, Excel spreadsheet, whatever I want to choose. So when we see this document, it looks like pretty much any document you would expect. You know, you've got things such as a company name, company role, document currency, document date, document number, et cetera, et cetera. The value of this is where you'll notice my cursor right now is a pointed arrow. If I move that cursor over these fields here, you notice how it changes. It looks like a double line with a right facing arrow. Well, that indicates that I can drill down into that item. So if I click on this, this shows me that I've got five lines to that invoice. And what it shows me is the product code, the commodity code, you remember that UNSPSC, UNSPSC code we talked about earlier, it's right there. We have the transaction type, so is it services, goods, et cetera, the gross amount, exempt amount, taxable amount, et cetera. And if I click on that first line, that first line went to Denver. So here's that breakout. You've got the city level tax, the district tax, so this is the transportation district, scientific cultural, and the state level here. And I can look at all the calculations that were part of that. I can then click this little arrow up here, takes me up a level or I can then choose line two, that went to Connecticut, jump to line five, and that went to Dallas. So the neat thing about this is hey, this allows me- Hey Tom, sorry to, to, sorry to yes. jump in on you there. Certainly. Um, we're, we're at 30 minutes left and um, we need to move on to Alteryx, but also we couldn't, your screen is stuck, so it wasn't moving around, we couldn't see that report. Oh, okay. Then uh, let me go ahead and stop sharing then, and then we can move on to Kelly so she can talk about the Alteryx connectors. All right, great. Well, first we're gonna start out with a question, a polling question. So um, what is your organization currently utilizing for analytics? Uh, that would be one, Alteryx, two, Power BI. Uh, it goes to four, three, Cognos, <laughs> Excel, other or none. And some of my clients I know for sure are, are using multiple ones of these. So um, this is a multiple choice question. You might be using Alteryx and also publishing, you know, workflows through Power BI, or you might be using, you know, several of these tools in-house. All right, so 24% of you are using Alteryx. Uh, some are using Power BI, 12%. Cognos, Excel, 29%, which I would expect, I would think. Um, so that with the Power BI is a pretty substantial number. Um, other tools as well, uh, and then none. So uh, thanks for sharing. Okay, well, um, thanks Tom and, and Joni earlier. Great, uh, great sessions. Um, I just, as Jody noted earlier, data management and compliance really uh, for our customers has been changing rapidly with environmental, political, uh, regulatory environments, 
uh, placing an enormous amount of pressure on you all, as you know. <laughs> uh, you need to do more with less. You need to respond uh, to incredible amounts of data uh, and change quickly. And you're needing to leverage that data to be more strategic within your organization. So at TR, we're looking at uh, some of these challenges more holistically now, and we're seeing how we can better partner with our clients uh, to put solutions in your hands faster, uh, but also how we can extend our products and better connect to your larger tax and financial ecosystems, uh, including people, process, and technologies to really dot, drive exponential growth and value uh, within your organization. Um, there's a couple ways that we're doing this. One is through our, through the platform strategy that Tom kind of gave you some insight into, and then you'll see some more from Bradley in a moment here uh, and the DMA team. And two is through our partnerships uh, like Alteryx. So we're, they are a leader in the analytics process automation space, um, but also our partners like DMA. Um, that relationship, they're bringing forward all that deep tax technical uh, IP uh, and the professionals that are certified to implement both OneSource and Alteryx. So together, hopefully, we're able to move you more rapidly down your tax technology roadmap and, and get to more strategic value add within your organization. Um, so uh, with the Alteryx partnership, we are a global reseller of Alteryx, which means you can purchase Alteryx on a TR order form, just like you do with some of our other products. Um, and, but you also will gain some uh, tax specific benefits. And we're gonna go through some of that with you today. Um, we think that with OneSource and Alteryx together, um, hopefully you'll see a ton of efficiencies around data, enhanced data automation and analytics. Um, so what is Alteryx? It is an APA solution. It's a brand new category. It's called uh, analytics process automation. And it shortens the time really for you to get from a business problem to a business solution. <laughs> so it's really unique in that instead of it being put into the hands of the IT professional or deep technologists, it's really, it's put in the hands of the tax professional. And it provides a code-free drag and drop uh, kind of end-to-end -end data management and analytics experience. Um, so you, it's from discovering on this left-hand side all your right data sources and the correct data sources to go after to collaborating with various teams and connecting to the data uh, directly and then prepping and blending that data and for use in various tax processes and then moving quickly into being able to use that data for reconciliation, filings, um, audit, and more strategic planning activities. Um, and then the neat thing is it's completely transparent all along the way. So as Bradley and, and uh, Joni and team walk you through it a little bit more with use cases, you'll see what I mean. Um, you'll see how our customers are, are kind of leveraging this great solution to connect to one-to-many data sources. So whether it's an ERP, or a subsystem from maybe some of your sales channels um, or Excel spreadsheets and other data sources to transform and merge that data for use in our direct, indirect tax uh, cycles, supply chain, and just really everywhere across tax, right? Um, and then being able to use um, that data once it's calculated and tax sensitized, if you will, um, to uh, reconcile it, analyze that data. Maybe you're analyzing it from period to period, year to year, or maybe you're even going back and analyzing it from various sales channels or from the ERP to the indirect tax engine, for example. Okay, so further um, on the platform, you'll note that we are building out application programmer interfaces to, those are just ways um, to push and pull data more easily in and out of one source. So in addition to those cool custom reports and dashboards that you saw Tom show you, uh, we also have the ability to pull and push data um, from the back end of the systems more easily. 
through tools like Alteryx. So we're gonna show you a little bit about that. Um, we're building out Alteryx connectors as well. So there's many, there's many benefits um, to purchasing Alteryx through Thomson Reuters. And so we thought we'd share that a little bit with you. Um, even for those of you, as Joni, I think mentioned in the beginning, there are, there are some of you that might have it in, in uh, accounting or finance or in another group, but you wanna expand to tax. Um, so if you do work with us, um, you will get access to those Alteryx connectors and uh, we're discounting those highly. And then you'd also have access to pre-built workflows, apps and macros that I'll kind of dig into in a moment through a data workflow library. And those are really pre-built solutions that um, you would be able to modify for your data and your environment. And they're built out across every tax process. So indirect um, and direct, as well as some of the other places like statutory reporting, um, supply chain, et cetera. Uh, we also recently launched a brand new uh, platform for crowd crowdsourcing support events, sharing trips, uh, ticks, trips and tricks, if I could speak. Uh, and that is the one source community. Um, but we have a group within there that we just launched, which is the Alteryx community. And so the firms like DMA will be able to get in there and provide, you know, kind of tax technical content, but we'll also have, um, you know, crowdsourcing tips and tricks on how to use Alteryx in every tax area and just bring a bunch of a wealth of knowledge and um, support to you guys uh, through this platform. Uh, we also have, uh, we work with DMA, so if they um, are helping you with various services, we just work alongside them to make sure that we're supporting you and, and offering you whatever you need in terms of help, training, and support. Okay. So let's kind of dig in a little bit here and just, I'll give you a little um, deeper kind of look at some of these uh, benefits and solutions that we have to offer you. This is a picture of the Alteryx connectors. And so there is a login connector um, to automate your authentication into the platform in a secure way. Um, and then a download and upload connector so that you can push and pull data from the platform. Uh, the connectors are downloadable from the admin uh, API tile. So when Tom was showing you the product, you saw all those tiles on the front page there you'll be able to download those directly from a tile. And then it would be residing directly on the Alteryx designer license. So as you see here, uh, we currently have four products live that we're connecting to um, with the Alteryx connector. So in the top left-hand corner here, you'll see our income tax compliance or OIT product has a connector. We have a next gen calendar, which also for you, uh, those of you in our indirect tax space that has all those types of obligations and dates in there as well. And that is uh, both domestic and global. We also have our uh, connector to our indirect tax next, next gen reporting engine. So that's exciting news for all of you. And our brand new data hub, which is really, um, exciting it's it's a new data lake for our, our um, customers that where they'll be able to store data such as entities accounts adjustments trial balances and so forth and be able to share that data across the platform um, so this is a uh, brand new and it's uh, it has connectors to it you'll also see that we have some um, apis that we have released into production uh, in the bottom left-hand corner there, and Alteryx can connect directly to that. Um, in Q4 and Q1, also, we have some other ones coming up. Our tax provision connector will be in beta in Q4. Um, data flow, for those of you who are interested in data flow, uh, very exciting, and our VAT GST indirect tax product, and then our global income tax product. So, um, if you just see this slide, this just shows you the tile, the platform again, and that's where you actually launch the, the uh, OneSource community. And it's just, um, you're able to log in there, you, you would all get an access to that community, and it's a brand new platform where we'll have gamification, events, and a lot of crowd, 
crowdsource sharing. Okay. Um, this slide, and I know we're running up against time, so Stephen, I'll just go really quickly here. Um, but we are offering you guys also a workflow library, and it has Alteryx really when you when you see it uh, when Bradley actually goes through the the product demo. Um, it, it is a platform in which you're creating workflows and you can do all kinds of things, extract, transform, load, um, do calculations, mapping, and analytics, but it comes with a blank canvas. So what we're doing is building out um, pre-built workflows, apps, and macros that will get, get, give you guys a starting point, so to speak, in every area of tax. Um, and this just shows you the different categories that we have available. So we have data loading categories, calculation type of categories, and analytics type of categories. So, um, and these are um, all of the acronyms. So o OPT would be our one source property tax. Um, you can see the different categories. IDT would be the indirect tax determination and so forth. So um, exciting new offerings that we're, we're bringing to the table here. And I just wanted to, to, to explain that um, Bradley and Joni are gonna go through some different use cases uh, with you guys. But the exciting thing about the product is it's for a relatively low dollar amount. It is, it, you're able to learn it very quickly and you can get up and running in within 14 days, you could actually build out meaningful workflows that are saving a ton of time, um, you know, reducing risk and errors and audit and penalties and other things. So these are some examples that we put in the deck of, of uh, workflows that we've built with clients alongside them in 14 days or less. And Kelly, we have a question yep. from, yep. from the group. Um, oh, yeah. question, if we already purchase one source and Alteric separately, do we have access to the one source Alteryx connectors? So you do, um, you, we would just license them to you. Um, you can definitely uh, license them through us. That's not a problem. Thanks, Kelly. Yep, thank you. So, feel, free to, feel free to reach out to me directly with questions around licensing. That's right, yep. And if you go to the next slide, and at the end, if there's any time, we can always, um, if there's questions about this. So some of those use cases we built out in this brand new program that we have, which is a discovery program. And you can talk to Steven about this as well. And Joni's team can, can participate as well to help us. Um, but we are offering some free trial licenses for those of you who don't have it. And we can go through a guided trial to help you actually build out use cases in, in your tax areas of painful processes. And at the end, you would have a business case and you would also have meaningful workflows that would have automated some of these processes very quickly. So I'll stop there and uh, we'll go to a polling question. Thank you so much. So what are your biggest concerns with the overall management of your indirect tax compliance function? So we'll see how those come back. Um, one thing I'll, I'll note while the answers are coming in is some people have used that um, discovery program to actually, as Joni mentioned, get all the key players understanding the ROI um, and the return on investment. So you can actually be pretty creative there in terms of you know, building out some use cases and, and sharing that ROI internally so that you can make a good business case for your, for your software. So it looks like risk mitigation is the winner here. Um, <laughs> definitely an era of risk. So I can totally see where that's coming into play, inefficiencies and, uh, and the resources right behind it. All right. Uh, today, I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about the Alteryx basics and get into the system and show off some of its basic features a bit. So the first thing I'm going to show is just our Thomson Reuters one source connector. And this is what is used to help easily interface with the direct tax, indirect tax, and, and other products that we offer in our one source suite. Um, so you'll see at the top in the connectors tab, we have these different options available for downloading, login, and upload. Uh, Kelly got into those earlier, so I don't want to rehash that a little bit too much. Uh, so currently on my screen is just a quick example of the interface being used. We have a login icon here at the very start and a download icon to quickly pull a report from our indirect tax solution. 
So you can, um, next in the, the download icon, you can see that they're pulling a transaction extract in here. And you can see that there's many other types of options that you have in here. You can pick which company you wanna pull the data from, as well as um, a limit on the number of transactions, the start date and end date of transactions, as well as uh, what kind of columns you want in your output. And you can see there's 743 different options here. We have a lot of options for tax data. Um, as we all know, tax data is very uh, cumbersome and, and uh, there's a lot to it. So you can choose whichever columns you need in here for downloading. And then you'll see at the bottom, this is a, a preview of the data that it pulled directly from the system. This isn't a flat file that was imported or anything of that nature. This is just a live pool of the data. Um, <clears throat> So from here, you have different options in here for like under the preparations tab. You can filter the data. So to filter the data based on certain credentials, for example, I can pull a report where I only want transactions that are say $1,000 or more, or I can have a tax amount of a certain amount, certain jurisdictions, et cetera. Um, next you have a formula as well. And this is where you can write your own formula for whatever you may need. Um, another common example is going to be like sample. So to sample the data, such as say taking the top 10 values, if you want to see the most expensive transactions to look to keep an eye on. And you can also say sort the data to also sort it in, in the highest value if needed as well. So in addition, you can also add data fields to your data set. Um, as an example, maybe you need to add a field that calculates the sum of other columns. Um, you can easily insert that into data sets. Um, you will also see sections for joining data parsing data, transforming the data, reporting, and countless other commands. So suffice it to say, if you have a desired output, Alteryx has a tool that can help you get there. Uh, the main thing I wanna emphasize here though is that you don't need to be a programmer. This is just very much just simple drag and drop of commands. So in my example here, it's just adding a simple formula here. And I wanna say, take this, this transaction dump and say, well, I only wanna see the tax amounts that are greater than $500. So if you hit that T over here, on that, it's going to basically filter the data based on that and only return it with that amount. Which apologies, my uh, computer seems to be really uh, lagging right now when I'm sharing my screen and running Alteryx at the same time. And there it goes. So at the bottom, you can see here with, with that selected as true, you can see the tax amounts that were greater than $500 as a good example. So in addition, there are, there are countless other systems that Alteryx has direct connections with, such as Tableau and Power BI that was mentioned. Um, databases for the back end, as well as flat files, if that, if that comes up as a, as a need as well. So next, I just want to show just a quick example of the type of reporting and output file that can be generated from Alteryx, where we have a use tax accruals by state. So it's in PDF format, and, and it shows all the different tax accruals by state, and it's separated into, say, state tax, county tax, city tax, and district tax. So that's just another example of the types of reporting that can be uh, quickly generated inside of Alteryx. So with that, I'm gonna, that'll do it probably for the demo portion. So next I'm just gonna go over a few of the slides that I had left. All right. So one of the items that we have seen a lot in indirect tax has been reconciliation. So most tax departments will have some type of reconciliation for all the filings to ensure that the GL balance ties out with the calculated amounts. So many times results in something we all know too well, which is spreadsheets. So copying data from multiple locations, utilizing formulas, and just generally hoping that everything ties out in the end. Um, Alteryx is a great solution for this type of common problem where it can compile the data from those many different sources and then reconciling it without having the risks and time consumption of doing it manually. So at the bottom of your screen is a great example of uh, what this kind of workflow can look like. On the left side of the workflow is just the general upload of two documents. So one from the ERP data and one from the one source data. It will then massage the data on both sides to make sure that they are in similar formatting. And then in the middle is where they are joined together. So from here, data from, the <clears throat> data from this branch is off into three different categories. So first at the top is gonna to be transactions in the ERP, but not in one source. And this would be a case for if you have some reason, have an invoice that was created in the ERP, but for some reason the tax engine wasn't called for a calculation. So you can generate a report to, to see if those kind of transactions come up. In the middle is where the invoice is in both the ERP and in one source, but for some reason the tax amount in the general ledger differs from the amount in one source. And this can happen for, for different reasons as well, such as maybe a vendor didn't charge tax on a purchasing invoice, 
um, or it didn't correctly accrue the full amount that one source returned, as an example. Um, this part is also further expanded to calculate the totals. And then it sends a live email to the tax manager with a warning notification and a report of the transactions. So this is just one of many examples of the possibilities. You could simply just export a report. If all you want to do is just quickly get a report extract, you can send an email notification, like in my example, or a combination of whatever you may need. So in this case, it's uh, just sending an email notification and you can run these on a daily basis, weekly basis, monthly basis, whatever your procedure calls for. Um, and finally at the bottom is for cases that an invoice is in one source, but not in the ERP for whatever reason as well. So you can see, see and reconcile from all sides there. So, so what does automated tax reconciliation bring? So first it brings credibility with audits. With an automated tax solution, you can quickly generate a report that shows your general ledger accounts, uh, accruals that, that tie with the amount calculated in one source indirect tax determination at an invoice to invoice level. Second, it, it saves you copious amounts of time. So instead of just pulling data from multiple sources, inserting formulas and hoping that everything was copied in full with the correct formulas, this instead connects directly to the sources and immediately gives you an output that is useful without all the coding and with, with simple dragging and dropping of commands. And lastly, it allows you to be proactive instead of reactive. So you can run your results on a monthly basis for say a template reconciliation report that you're used to handling in Excel, whatever it may be, or you can also run them on a daily or weekly basis, as I mentioned, that maybe sends out an email notification if a reconciliation issue is found. So that's just some of the basic ways that, that Alteryx can help you save time and avoid risk from an indirect tax perspective. Um, with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Joni to, to uh, present some more of the advanced use cases. All right, thanks, Brad. And one comment, I, I think it's really exciting, all of the new workflows and APIs that the TR group, uh, one source is putting together. I think that's gonna provide a lot of value to clients, um, you know, that are looking to integrate the Alteryx solution. So really excited to see those new developments. So to, to close out today's um, webinar, I'm just gonna talk real briefly about some of the solutions and give you guys some examples of solutions that we've created for, for clients using Alteryx and really how those have helped, you know, our clients, you know, manage their day to day process. And so this first example, and really wanted to give you guys a feel for like what each of these functions, because there are a lot of different functions that you can incorporate in your workflow. And so in this instance, we're really helping trying to help the client identify where uh, non taxable um, tax codes have been assigned and pulling and extracting that data for a new entity. And in this case, the client had a new entity. They really didn't know a lot about their business and their purchases. And so they really wanted to be able to isolate that data that had been migrated into their um, SAP instance. And so we created this, this data extracts file with our a program that we've cr created um, from SAP and really performed a number of tasks so that each month the client could get an output of um, both taxable tax codes and non-taxable tax codes to review and help them understand the nature of the transactions for a newly acquired entity. In this example, um, you know, this particular flow was created um, to help the, the client review their vendor spend. So here, a little bit more complex situation, but one of the things I wanted to point out about the flow that was really great and intuitive for the client was we created this, this um, exclusion file. And so the way the client's gonna use this file every month is they're gonna have a set of vendors they wanna review. And as new vendors come on, they're gonna wanna review those vendors and make sure those vendors are charging tax. With that, this little exclusion file, what it does is every month we update, once we feel comfortable the vendors charging the tax accurately, we'll update this exclusion file so we reduce the number of vendors and transactions that we review each month. And so the output file that was developed, that was um, created by that allows the, the client to both look at taxable and non-taxable codes by vendor, while also looking at specific tax codes um, for a particular vendor as well. And so this is a nice example of a repetitive process that we're able to pull into Alteryx and create um, the ability to review vendor spend by, by tax codes. And then this final one, 
shows you a very complex uh, Alteryx flow that we created um, that really grabs a lot of data, reviews it, but really the, the goal of this was to review um, two things. The inventoryable items that were set up as tax exempt, but I, but there was, we were able to identify that were replacement parts really going to this non-taxable category that potentially should not be. So we created a flow to find those material groups and extract those so that we could review them and accrue depending on the location of where that, that particular inventoryable item was created. In the bottom flow, we created this streamline process, taking a lot of the information from the inventoryable flow but creating a, an ability to um, review accruals on a monthly basis. And also using that functionality we talked about earlier about that exclusion list for items that you might be new or material groups that come in that are new or that you don't wanna review because they generally um, tend to be accurate. So that's all I have. I wanna thank everybody for joining today. And I'm gonna pass it over to Angela to kind of close up for us, but we appreciate all of you joining us today for the webinar. And thank you to our speakers today. We certainly appreciate it, both Thomson Reuters and DMA. Feel free to reach out to anybody on this slide. We will be sending out the presentations for you. Um, but again, thank you for joining us and we hope to see you on the next seminar series.